I owe an apology to Betty. I owe an apology to Leon. I changed my mind on which sermon I'm going to preach first. And the reason is, I called somebody yesterday and asked them if they would make sure that they would be here for the second sermon because we had a discussion that revolves and revolves all around the second sermon. I want that person to be here. So with that said, I apologize, love you to death, but I'm going to change. Uh, the first sermon will be the second sermon. <clears throat> it's about Joseph's, Joseph Persavus. Anybody name your kid Joseph Persavus? If you do, this is about another one. <clears throat> How well do you remember, church, a man called Shemuel? and we got him. I didn't know. These two were two of the twelve spies sent by Moses to check out the promised land. Uh, these two and eight others brought back news that God's people could not defeat these people. They're too big. They're too strong. We don't have a chance. We can't. We love to go to the promised land, but it's not going to happen. We can't beat these guys. They showed their lack of faith in who? God Almighty. You know, we can do anything with God's help. They forgot that. Genesis 28, 13. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. And if God says it, it's going to happen. If God says that He will send His Son to earth to die on the cross for you, each one of you individually and me, then it's going to happen and it did. God don't lie. God said He would give them this land. He didn't say that is if the people not worked out, got muscles and got uh, cannons in it. You're going to get the land. Where was their faith? This land is located in ancient Canaan in the eastern side of the Mediterranean Sea in Numbers 34, 1 through 12. I'll give you the exact boundaries if you want to know where it's at. How well do you remember old Joshua and Caleb? Those two you might remember. These two of the spies did their best to convince the whole congregation, contrary to what the other people said, God will give them victory, showing the true faith in God. You know, it seems to me in all my life of sales that I have noticed the positive, no doubting people are this big, the people with that's all over the place are that big. They're outnumbered. Seems like it's just true. That's the way it is. How well do you remember Matthias? Who's he? He, the one chosen to take the place of Judas as the twelfth apostle. How well do you remember the other guy? Well, I remember Matthias. How well do you remember the other guy who was considered to take the place of Judas and he wasn't chosen? Who is he? He's the guy we're talking about today. Joseph Versalus. It's this man that I want us to think about this morning and as we're studying and remembering this guy Joseph Persavus. I'm going to call him Joseph a whole lot of time in this sermon because it would take too long to say the whole name. I want to sort of see if I can be putting myself in his place. I'd like you to do the same. Because as we study what he might have done, might not have done, that could represent us in many facets of our life. I want to ask you this before I get started. If right now the end of time came, God's going to judge your heart and He knows it already. Are you in God's sight this second of your life an encourager, positive, and believe 100% in God? Or are you one of those doubtful people that cause problems? Always mad about something. Think about it. Are you or are you not? Everybody here fits in one of those two categories. And we all fit, including myself, in both those categories time to time in my life. I just don't want it to be ever again. Acts chapter 1, verse 16 and 18. Men and brethren, 
This scripture had to be fulfilled, which was the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning this Judas guy that's going to betray Christ, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. He was prophesied way back, and here he is, and he did it. Do you remember Judas went out and kissed him on the cheek? This is a guy, got his silver. Ooh. For he was numbered with us. He was an apostle. Yeah, don't tell me you're too strong to fall. There's not one in here that can't fall at any time in your life. What you do is you start off weak and get weaker and finally you're gone. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part of this ministry. How shameful. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of his iniquity. And falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and his entrails gushed out. He was rotten from within. He could not believe later when it finally hit him what he did. He forgot, like we're always talking about, search your own heart right now. You better be worried about yourself getting to heaven first. Because you ain't going to get nobody to heaven if you ain't straight. Your example, what's in your head and everything else, it's got to be on target. And it became to, known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem so that the field is called in their own language, Akeldama. That is, field of blood. There stands a Greek Orthodox monastery there today. Really? Yeah. He couldn't take it. Get to finally looking in here that you ought to be doing all the time of your life and you blow your brains out. He hung himself. I don't want to be like that. You don't want to be like that. But what else could you do but blow your own brains out if you had turned Jesus, the Savior, the Son of God, into the enemies? Here He is. Remember me at all times. I'm the one. Oh, man. Now let another take his office, the apostles decided. They thought of the men that had accompanied them all the time through from the beginning to end, and they chose two they felt they were qualified. One of them is old Joseph Bersamus. The other was Matthias. Okay, you've worked hard to become a Christian. You've worked hard at work to become whoever you are. You've worked hard in your life to become who you are. And now you want some kind of reward for it. Instead of being pick number one, you're pick number two. How does that affect you? When you walk through the doors of this building right here, if you got your chest out, your back bowed back, got your head up, I'm important, I'm here, I'm special, I know more than all of you do, better watch it. Then they prayed and did the right thing. They asked God to make the decision. Uh, he knew the hearts. He knew the hearts of you and me and these two also. And God decided it would be Matthias. Verse 24, Matthias is chosen, but have you ever wondered about what happened to this guy named Joseph? What did he do? Let's look at some things that he might have done. This is where I put myself into this sermon. What could have happened to Joseph? He could have gotten angry and become bitter. Hey, <laughs> I can't believe this. They chose him over me. He's got more influence than I do. Man, I've been a Christian all my life. I've studied this Word all my life. I, I'm the one you need to be looking up to. What if your preacher did that? I'm special. He could have gotten angry and he could have gotten bitter. But I would hope he would remember Ephesians 4.31. Let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. When one is self-serving, all about me, myself, and I, it's all what I want. I want to be comfortable. Don't make anything inconvenient for me. You work around my life. I'm not going to have my life work around you. In this situation of being so close to becoming one of the apostles, that far away, 
He could have spent the rest of his life carrying a grudge. You know, when you carry a grudge, it seems like it's not like getting mad, blowing off your temper, and about two hours later you're over and you're thinking, man, I wish I could control my mouth. I'm an idiot. No, we're talking about carrying a grudge. Not only for a week or two, but years and decades, and some all of their life. He could have very easily done that. And it's like a lot of people do today that do that. They actually blame it on God, finally. I give up. You know, if God was real God, He wouldn't have let this happen. I'm sick of it. A lot of people hold grudges because He took their loved one away from them. I could do that. Oh, man. Are you kidding? The only hope I got is in God. I don't want to grudge towards God. As a matter of fact, now that it's all over, God took my baby away because she really was precious. And she had seen all this kind of stuff that she needed to see. And what's going on now, I'm glad she didn't get to see it. Or he didn't answer the prayers the way I thought he should. He didn't pick me. He could have murmured and listened to the murmuring of other people. That is so dangerous. If you're negative about something, you want to stir up a little stink, the first thing usually people do is try to go out and get one or two to stand with you. Now once you've got two or three people backing you, then you're ready to go against anybody and anything. you got your mind made up. If you're mad, you just get madder. And they'll help you get madder. And if you want to really stir up a stink, they're right behind you. All of a sudden, man, it's just out of control. He could have done that. Philippians 2.14 do all things without complaining and disputing. Well, I told it. Did you hear the gospel? Do all things without complaining and disputing. Yeah, but God, when He writes something, do you think He made a mistake? He just put that in there for the fun? He meant what He said. We don't need to be complaining. We don't need to be trying to cause disputes. Then Joseph could have also said things like this. Give me a break. Who does Matthias think he is? You know, if we had deacons and elders and we chose Joe Blow here to be a deacon, would there be anybody else saying, who does he think he is? He's not as, you don't know him like I do. Let me point out his mistakes. I can discredit him real quick because I'm good at it. I find a mistake in it. Well, you know what? I can't do. There's nobody walking on earth. Even some of the most precious people I've ever known, and a whole bunch of them, are right here in this congregation. I can still find fault. We can do that in anybody if that's what we're out to do. Give me a break. Who does he think of that? He's not qualified. I'm more qualified than he is. He would have needed to remember 1 Samuel 16, 7. Listen up. But the Lord said to Samuel, Hey, do not look on appearance or the height of his stature because I rejected him. I did not pick him. <clears throat> he was trying to compare Saul that stood head and shoulders above everybody. Oh, he's tall. I'm on, I want him, God. God can look in here. Instead, he picks this little sheep herder, scrawny guy. He's the king now. What's wrong with God? Nothing's wrong with God. And hey, Joseph, there's nothing wrong with you. I picked Matthias because I know a little bit better than you do. That's all. For the Lord sees not as a man sees, but looks on the outward appearance. But the Lord looks into the heart. He knows my heart and He knows your heart. Here and when we walk out that door till we come back in here and He still knows it. He does. He could have allowed his hurt and disappointment to flat out not only destroy himself, but the people that were close to him. Because if you're hurt, you're, you're grabbing for somebody to join in with you to be hurt. If you're failing and falling away, what do you need? You need more support so you can bring them with you. We've got to be careful with that. Can you imagine basing one's faith on if you got your feelings hurt or not? Raised up with church, no more smart my feelings. I'm done. 
Well, son, you're done with your own soul. You're really losing the battle. If somebody hurts your feelings, go back, look them right in the face and say, I'll tell you one thing right now. I forgive you and I love you. I ain't going to do that. Well, that's up to you. What about us? How do we handle hurt and disappointment? What would happen if I were to stop this sermon right now? I want everybody to come up here and get on the microphone and tell us, you know, uh, who's hurt your feelings and why you're not doing so-and-so. Anybody here that's hurt, come on up. Tell us all about it. We ain't going to do that. What should have happened to Joseph? I don't know that any of this past stuff I just talked about did. Could have. It certainly goes on today. So I couldn't help but apply it to Joseph. But what about the other side? What should Joseph have, have had done? He should have realized that though he was not chosen to be the apostle, he was still chosen to be God's child. Can you imagine being anything greater? You tell me what it is. Well, I want Publishers Clearinghouse. I'm worth $35 billion. Or I'm, I own Alaska. What? Nothing is greater than being a child of God. Nothing. He might have gotten the Heisman Trophy. He didn't get the Heisman Trophy if you go into football. You know, Matthias did. He got the Heisman Trophy. He was the quarterback, the star of the show. But he forgot, could have, that he was still on the Super Bowl championship team, just like all of us are. We may not be the greatest and the biggest and have the biggest reputations and all, but we're on the big Super Bowl team, guys. We're Christians. We're God's children. Ephesians 1, 4. Just as He chose me and you in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Please let us be holy. If we can be holy in love of our hearts and we walk as children of God all of our lives, we're bringing people to Christ by our example as much as we are as what comes out of our mouth. You know, there's people in here that can approach me and when they do, I've told you about it. I can't help them. I know that they got love in their heart. Christian love. I feel it. And you know what? They might need a brain transplant because I feel like they love me. I can just feel it. You know, there's people like that. And you just can't wait for it. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. You want it. You want that love. You want to share it. And I hope that you want to share your love with them. Joseph Brasavis, as well as each of us, are elect. The elect people. Special. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father. In sanctification of this. What is that? Set aside. Set apart. We're special. Sanctification of the Holy Spirit for obedience. Why are we set apart? To obey for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Christ. 1 Peter 1 2. Sanctified means set apart. Set apart. And if you don't know about the sprinkling of the blood of Christ, you can go to 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 through 9. You're walking in the light. You're walking in the word of of Christ and His Father who sent Him, the doctrine of Christ. You're doing what you're supposed to do. And if you fail, you, in verse 9, you automatically confess your sins to God with a soft heart and you ask for forgiveness. And that blood is continually sprinkling on the child of God all through His life. What did Joseph Persavus do after the election of God? It is very probable, knowing this guy, if he was that close to being chosen as an apostle, that he accepted the knowledge of 1 Peter 2.9. And this applies to me and you, boys and girls. You are a chosen generation. Chosen by who? God Himself. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. And with that said, we need to act like it. We don't need to walk around with chips on our shoulders. We need to act like it. 
His own special people that you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of sin or darkness into His marvelous, marvelous light. That's us. Do you know I just described everybody in here by God's Word? Just like us today, we're two true children of God, having obeyed the gospel plan of salvation. We all have, and I see it here. We make our individual decisions to be committed or not worthy, not committed, nearly committed, fully committed, right on the sideline of really being a full child of God or man, that's just close enough. I'm going to set my parameters. I'm going to draw my lines as a Christian. This is all I need to do. And don't you cross that line telling me I'm wrong about nothing. I'm going to protect my boundaries that I have self-centeredly put up around me. Nah, I ain't going to do that. Or I can be worthy of God's choosing. Man has become often so blind to the commitment he should have had to God. Like Israel, the Holy Spirit said to Paul in Acts chapter 2, 26 and 27, Go to this people and say, Hearing, you will hear. You know, I hope and pray there's nobody here today that matches this. So let's think of other people. I hope it's not us. But at the same time, I said we've got to put ourselves in His shoes. Go to this people and say, Hearing, you will hear and shall not understand. And seeing, you will see and not perceive. Do anybody like that? They might have heard a million sermons. And it always applies to the other guy and never them. For the hearts of these people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes they have closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears lest they should understand with their hearts in turn so that I should heal them. If you want to be the way you are and not look into your own heart, be lost, that's up to you. Whoa! Number 6, 9, and 10. It is a small thing to you that the God... Is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to Himself and do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord and stand before the congregation and serve Him and that He has brought you near to Himself, near to God? You and all your brethren, the sons of Levi with you, is it just a small thing that just happened? Let me interject something here. Do you think it's just a small thing in your heart and your mind that God has chosen you, a royal priesthood, has chosen you to be His children? Now, it's not a small thing at all. Are you seeking the priesthood also, He says? Church, we all gather together right now to praise God. Or are we against Him in any way in our life by the parameters that we have put around our own meaning of our spirit and our own wants and wishes? Are we against His Word? Trying to make His Word fit what we want it to fit? To say what we want? Are we carrying our banner? This is what I want to be remembered for. This is the main point that I've got forever. Oh, get off of it. Brothers and sisters, God has brought us closer than anyone in the history of the world through Jesus Christ and who we have been baptized into. All of us in here, I believe, have been actually baptized into the body of Jesus Christ spiritually. We are part of that body, that kingdom, the church. And should, and should open our hearts and spirit and live for Christ every minute of our life. Commitment through our lives should be shown in our attitudes. What we're known for. Not the frown face, but the smiley face in our words, in our actions, in our example, and in our attendance. The attendance on this board, I'm going to be discussing at length the next Sunday that I get to preach here. It won't be next Sunday. We'll have a great speaker up here. But the next Sunday, I'm going to address it with all I got. Because I love you. 
And I want to go to heaven. And if you ever look up Ezekiel 33, 8 and 9, it's my job as a preacher, if I'm going to go to heaven, to warn people that are not committed to God with all the love in their heart. That right there, that right there is what I'll be addressing. And I will not be addressing it to be mean. I'll be addressing it not only to save your soul, but to save my own. I have to. I don't have a choice. Because I want to go to heaven. Yes, my attendance is really important. He should have rejoiced with those who rejoiced. And I believe, I believe old Joseph probably did. Romans 12, 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. If we truly love one another, as we all know we're supposed to, let me ask you this. There were two people in here that I hadn't heard of this morning when I come in that were deathly sick. And it just breaks my heart that I couldn't get in touch with them to tell them I love them, I'm praying for them, I have them on my, on my thoughts and my prayers. If I don't know you, I can't pray for you. If I don't know you, I can't tell you I love you. Not with sincerity. Do you love everybody here? Yeah. What's his name? I don't know. What's her name? I don't know. Do you know him at all? Not really. But I love him. Oh, come on. We've got to show our love to each other. When we come together in worship, do you know all your family here? Then you get to know them if you don't. Do you pray with all your family, for all your family, with sincerity of heart? You can't do that if you don't know them. Are you singing together to one another, warning each other and teaching one another? You do that with fellowship. You can't show your spiritual affection by not showing your feeling. There's nothing better than coming together as the church, the family of God. Every chance you possibly can. I can't tell you I love you if I can't talk to you. And if I don't know you, it's just words. He should have learned the dis discipline of submission. There's discipline in submitting to God. We all have our place in God's choosing. God's got something for me. He's got something for you. And every position in here is important. When you go to work, when you go to your social parts of your life, you are God's hope that the people around you will become His children. You carry a big responsibility on your shoulders. We all have a place in God choosing. We need to accept His choice and accept the dis discipline of our submission, Hebrews 5.8. We all can't drive the bus. You can only have one person driving the bus. But I guarantee you one thing. We all have talents and we need to use them. Colossians 3.22 We as bond servants obey in all things our masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of the heart. Fearing God. Did we all look forward to being here this morning? Or did you come up because you're supposed to? I have to. I'm here because I don't want anybody picking on me. That's not why we come. We come to worship God. We only got four hours a week that we've really allotted to do that together as a family. Try to be here. Try to be here. We have the opportunity right now, each one of us, to exemplify to each other and to the whole world that we're true God-fearing children of God. And like in every decision in life, every decision we make, right or wrong, influences someone. May God help us to overcome our disappointments. He wasn't disappointed. He wasn't even chosen to be one of the apostles. But He wasn't disappointed. I don't know that. But I know the man. The apostles thought enough of Him to put Him up there. I can't judge anybody here that you're going to go to heaven or hell either. But my confidence is in you. My loving family. Children of God. Part of the church that Jesus Christ established. And as your preacher, I beg of you, you search your heart and you get yourself applied to commitment to God in every facet of your life. And may we instead realize the blessings that we have in Jesus. It's a short and simple sermon. 
If you have a need of any kind, if you've not been baptized into the body of Christ, there'll never be a better time. If there's a change in your life or any confession that you make, there'll never be a better time than to do that than now. If you have a need, come forward as we stand and as we sing.